you are erased from his memory because there is nothing that he can do for you so he doesn't have to think about you his thoughts are many towards us because he has plans for us it's in, it's in, our, our names are engraved in the palms of, of his hands because he has plans for us he has things prepared for us therefore we matter to him when you don't matter to the Lord he erases you from his memory he doesn't know anything about you so it's a depart from me I knew you, I know you, I knew you not you're workers of iniquity so he has no record of you anymore because you know you're not needed the father did not need him therefore he can't need you either So in the last event of um, the, the fourth coming is is preceding the fifth coming. So in, in as a as a um, as a precursor to the fifth coming, we have um, we have this happening here now that the Antichrist or the beast from the sea, the bearer of the name quoted in six six six, and the false prophet. Or the beast from the earth, or the beast from the the, the bottom of the pit, is the same per, the same creature, the same person, the same individual, are both arrested and thrown into the local fire. Satan is arrested, but he is placed after being chained, and a seal placed 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 on him, not to deceive the world again, to be kept in the bottom of the pit for a thousand years. That's what happens before the fifth coming. And the scripture that we, we read before is the same one uh, we're going to read again. Uh, Revelation 19, chapter 19, verse 19 to, to 21. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured. So, what we have to understand here is that it seems that there is a jump. You know, the battle was set in a rise, it was ready to, to happen, and suddenly the beast were captured. Obviously, there was a fight, fight before then. Okay? The Lord had killed his enemies. Okay? So, 20, uh, uh, verse 20. Then the beast was captured, and within the false prophet who we we worked signs in his presence, by which he, dece he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two, I mean the beast and the false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, our Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of the army of the Lord. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Okay? So all the enemies of God that uh, fought against us were all beaten, killed, and the birds, you know, enjoyed uh, themselves um, by feeding on them, on the, on the on their cadavers. Okay. Chapter twenty, verse one. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So this is the first event before the fifth coming, which was also the last event after the forthcoming. So Satan, the dragon, is locked up in the bottom spit, chained and sealed with an inscription not to see the world, the world again until a thousand years expired. The false prophet who carried out a bidding, performing signs and wonders to convince the people of the world, of the earth, that worshipping the beast was something, was, hot, was uh, something to provide them uh, with, the, with the recourse, it was something to do uh, because the beast had uh, some sort of a, uh, a divinity about him.
he got arrested as well with the beast was the antichrist and both of them were not killed but were captured alive and thrown into the bottomless pit into the, the lake of fire which is the second death so they're gone that's it yeah. now what happens after that so after Satan's are locked up the beast and his prophet false prophet are thrown away or thrown into a lake of fire now we're moving on to the second the, the second event the second event is about the saints of God reigning okay. the reign of the saints of God for of, of a thousand years okay. where are the saints of God now we are on earth okay. this is what the scripture says continue with, with uh, chapter 20 of the book of Revelation uh, from uh, verse 4 and I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for, the, for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with, with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection okay. right so the scripture is telling us here what happens after satan is bound for a thousand years the beast and his false prophets are no longer there and the enemies of god have all been killed it is a peaceful time when the, the, the saints of god are reigning here on earth with Lord Jesus Christ among them okay, for a thousand years. It's incredible. A millennium will enjoy life really on this planet before it gets destroyed. The Lord is probably saying that we need to really enjoy life because He created this life, this planet for is for righteousness to reign in it. And, and for those that are his instrument of righteousness to find pleasure, to find pasture, to enjoy life, you know, to laugh, to, to, to jubilate. You know. He's not happy to see us sad, you know, to see us uh, uh, duped, to, 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 to see us, you know, uh, experiencing grief. He's not happy about that. It does hurt. It does hurt him when he sees us in in in, in, in uh, sad and 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 uh, demoralized and and so on. So he says, "Comfort, you, comfort, you, my people." Why? Because he wants us to be comforted. That time, you know, we'll have all the comfort we can think of. We'll enjoy the last aspect of luxury of this life that this life has to offer. Being righteous. In the presence of the Lord. Amen. So, what is the first resurrection? Now, we've talked about this uh, concept before. That the first resurrection does not mean that when you are, you are resurrected for the first time. It means being resurrected during the consummation of the will of God as it pertains to the coming of the Lord and the harvesting of the saints, the rapture and the going to heaven and uh, the judgment being passed and so on. That's the first resurrection. When we are res being resurrected to either face judgment or to, to go to glory. Because there were those that, were, were, that, that died before that the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected. And they died again. Lazarus, for, for, for instance, Lazarus of Bethany. He died. After four days, the Lord resurrected him. But Lazarus did not stay alive permanently. Because we don't know where he is. If he, if he was, if he was permanent, we'd have known about Lazarus. Or the, the apostles talked about, oh, that Lazarus is still, is still here with us. But Lazarus died again. 
So the Council of Lazarus would have been resurrected twice? No. You'd have died twice, but not resurrected twice. Yes, resurrected twice, but each time you are resurrected, it is the first resurrection, because that resurrection is, uh, is, 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 it is embedded in the promise of God because of the resurrection life that Christ Jesus has purchased for us, that guarantees us eternal life. For that reason, every time one is resurrected, is this the first resurrection? Because that resurrection, you are, being, you are being brought back up to glory, to manifest the hidden glory that Christ in us, the hope of glory. That glory that may, be, that may seem hidden presently will be fully manifested because this body will change. This sinful body, this mortal body will give way to the immortal. This corruptible body will give way to the incorruptible. That's the effect of the first resurrection. The resurrection that uh, offers us eternal life. So those who miss that resurrection, that means they have no part in the kingdom of God. They will be brought back up, we shall see, yes. But their resurrection won't be the first resurrection because... They are not being brought back up to face glory, to enter glory. They are being brought back up to face their judgment. So those that will still be alive will face their judgment along those that be dead. In parallel to those that be alive in Christ and those that be or sleeping will be dead in Christ will resurrect and change together to enter glory and experience the promises of the hidden glory that was once given unto them. Now to experience it in the kingdom of God, to have the material evidence of that glory in the most tangible form possible and to have a face to face with the Lord God himself and to be in the company of other saints and the angels of God and, and, and the the, the, the multiple of, uh, figures or personalities uh, or, or heavenly beings that we, we have read in the scriptures, the 24 elders, we see all of, all of them, the four living creatures, we'll see them and have, have, have a talk with them. They're all part of the same kingdom of God that we're serving. Amazing things that we'll be experiencing. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. Things we should be looking forward to so eagerly. Amen. Right. So, another scripture to emphasize on our millennial reign as kings and priests in the kingdom of God. Second Timothy verse two, so Second Timothy chapter two verse twelve, as the Bible tells us, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Paul writing to Timothy, admonishing him, teaching him, revealing the mystery to him. So if we endure, we shall also reign with him. Because our faith draws contention, draws battles. Many are the afflictions to righteous. The righteous afflicted not because he's sinning or he's incompetent in life. He does not how to earn a good living. That's not what it means. The righteous experience more afflictions because of his faith. In the system of this world, that is not set up to favor the it's not set up to favor the righteous. The world is set up to favor sin. It's set up to promote evil. We've, we've mentioned this before. Even all the laws that are there, that may seem to have been drawn out of wisdom. But any challenge to those laws where righteousness is likely to, to be promoted will be pushed back and the same law that seemed to be promoting righteousness 
on face value will be per uh, perversed in order to to keep righteousness at bay. So the world is not for the righteous. So the Lord Jesus Christ in his prayer says that Father, I, 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 I pray that you do not take them out of the world and that they are not of the world as I am not of the world. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ distance himself from this world? Because precisely because this world is not meant for the righteous. So whenever righteousness is being propagated, there is a pushback, there is a challenge, there is a, there's a fight. So the righteous was likely to, to suffer. So the endurance aspect that Paul is talking about here is because we need to endure those afflictions, we need to endure those trials. We, we, we meet them in various areas of our lives because we are tested because of that righteousness because we are more than conquerors so we must conquer we are given the opportunity to conquer that we have evidence of our status as, as, as conquerors more than conquerors as overcomers you have to have something to overcome so that is what we need to be able to, uh, to we need to remember that if we endure for righteousness sake for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, for the sake of what he has done for us, for the sake of recognizing that he also endured pain, humiliation, ridicule to the level that none of us will ever experience, yet he pursued, he followed through with the will of the Father that you and I today may be in the kingdom. It is a small matter for us to be asked to also endure for his name's sake. To show that the only evidence that we have of loving him is not the money that he's, gi he's given us or the, the property he's given us or the beautiful wife that he's given us or the beautiful children that he's given us, but that we can trust in his word even when we don't understand what's going on around us. That we can trust him even when things are falling apart. To know that we are still in his perfect will. And the trials of our faith are meant for a good purpose. So in us enduring, we are only preparing for our standing with him when the time comes for us to reign with him in his kingdom, which he has purchased for us. Amen. And another scripture to add to that. It's in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 10. The word of God tells us. The word of God says, Revelation, chapter 5, verse 10. Have, so if we read from, 11, from 9, it will, it will, it will make um, sequential sense. Okay. Or start it from 8. We've seen chapter 5 of the book of Revelation. So we start from verse 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. But the the prophetic declaration here by the the twenty four elders. is not saying what, what, what they are claiming as an experience. The 24 elders did not need to be redeemed. They did not commit any sins. They have been, they, they've been faithful servants of our God, part of the kingdom, wonderful individuals. And they have stayed on course in worshipping and serving their God. They have never committed any sins. 
So this declaration does not refer to them. They've been able to say these words because they were given the content of the prayer of the saints. We say these things because it means something to us. We have experienced it. So when we pray in our spirit, our spirit is praying, speaking mysteries. Those are the prayers that the Lord collects and keep it in heaven because those prayers are speaking directly to his will concerning us. So in our core working with the Lord, our prayers do contribute. So the Lord uses our prayers because Lord God doesn't work on his own. He needs a witness to work with. And who is a better witness than someone who is involved in the scheme? Someone for whom the scheme has been set up in the first place. So he's involving us. So our prayers are not all about, Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. Lord, look at what they're doing to me. And so on. It is also about the prayers that are concerned with the fulfillment of the will of God. Especially when we pray in tongues. In the spirit, we are contributing, we are announcing, we are uh, performing, we are touching with great importance what must happen in accordance with the will of the Father. We are speaking those promises. So that's the emphasis that we shall reign here on earth. That reign, that scripture, refers both to this old earth, planet earth, which shall be destroyed, illuminated, and the new which shall be built. Amen. Okay. And after that, there's another event. Yeah. Release of Satan and his global deception will start. We talked about Satan being arrested and uh, thrown into the bottom of his pit, chained with a seal uh, that uh, um, stops him from deceiving the world. And he's going to be locked up for a thousand years. So... At this stage now, Satan is being released. And this is our event C, under the fifth coming. The scripture we have for that is in the book of Revelation, chapter 20 again. We've read this before, verse 1 to 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up and set his seal on him so that he should not deceive his nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So Satan is going to be released after a thousand years. Now here is where he gets released. In the same chapter 20 of the book of Revelation, we start from verse 7. And the Bible tells us, When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Now this is a poetic language because the earth is not square, the, the earth is round and the Bible, the Bible tells us the earth is round because the Lord Jesus, the Lord God himself, is, you know, uh, make mention of this in the book of Isaiah that he will sit on the, on the circle of the earth so he knows the earth is round because he created it. Yeah. There's never been any contention with that at all. So here is poetic language that the four corners of the earth. Could not to say that, to suggest that the earth is, the Bible is saying the earth is square. Okay. Okay. Uh, verse, uh, verse 8 And will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So Satan will be released to carry on his deceptive schemes. 
the seal expired as well after a thousand years because he had served his time for that particular punishment. So he goes out to go and deceive the world because that's what he likes to do best, telling lies, causing contention, sowing seed of doubt, discord, bumping people into each other, husband and wife, siblings, friends, church members. That's what Satan is good at. If two children of God are having an argument, it is regrettable that's happening. They shouldn't. But you need to realize you don't have to have you don't, you don't have to have an argument with your brother or your sister. Somebody's putting putting you up to it. And just what exactly are you arguing about? That you can't resolve. And this is what Satan is good at, causing contention, creating havoc, trouble, carnage, pandemonium. So he goes out to all the four corners of the earth in searching this idea of a war because he can't help himself. So what he's doing, although deceptive, although abhorrent and sinful, but it is feeding into the plan of God nonetheless. And this is the result of it. So all the nations at the time because the camp of the Lord of the saints will be set up in Jerusalem. So all the saints will be there in Jerusalem. And the world, the rest of the world outside. Those that survived Armageddon, obviously, that did not die during Armageddon, will still carry on. It's incredible that the Lord would have extended uh, some, of their, some, of, some of these people's lives, or to a certain extent, but they were not offered eternal life. Because they'll still be coming or dying or whatever condition, disease, whatever. But uh, the time will come where all souls, both that dead and alive, will have to stand before uh, the, the judgment seat of God to give account of their lives. So there'll be a demarcation. The saints are in their camp in Jerusalem. Outside are the non believers, the unbelievers, or the dogs. And this is what happens. So the idea was to bring them for a final showdown, another war. In this case, the Bible tells us that in verse 9, that they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Satan gets released and he goes about deceiving as always by bringing all these nations to come and fight against the saints of God and to attack. Jerusalem. And we have an interesting uh, context there. The name Gog and Magog. Yeah. There have been lots of um, um, offerings in terms of what this, how to address this concept, uh, these, uh, these two uh, um, names in the context of the end times. And and what the prophecy of, of Ezekiel uh, offers as well in, in, in terms of how to align them with the plan of God okay? and what the particular area um, within the world or on the map you know can we place uh, these these two areas you know by the grace of God we're trying to give us a bit of a you know a, a expose from our point of view yeah? having also looked at what Others have said, okay? there's not so much of contention as most of the ideas that are, are suggested tend to agree along the way. Okay? So there is a conclusion that everybody accepts um, on, on, on these two, uh, on this matter, as far as Gog and Magog are, are concerned. Okay? 
So this is what the scripture tells us. Uh, there is a bit of history. If we go to the book of Genesis, chapter 10, verse 1, the Bible says that, Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. So Noah had three sons after the flood, before the flood, and uh, when the whole world was um, exterminated because they did not um, believe the message that Noah preached of salvation, because the Lord had enough of the sins and the rampage that was being caused and the carnage, the human behaviour and uh, the act of criminality and you know cruelty and enslavement and all, all sorts were happening that really um, uh, it could not uh, sustain um, you know beholding anymore therefore he had to put a stop to it and that's the method that he chose but he gave a chance to whoever would desire him to get on the the, the ark of salvation and Noah's ark which he instructed Noah to, to, to build but no one responded only eight individuals were saved. Noah's wife, his three sons and their wives, and the animals that were brought on board because the Lord had to, wanted to preserve the, their generations. The Lord doesn't go back to start recreating animals again because he had rested the seventh day. So he just had to preserve their generations so that when the time comes they will repopulate because he had blessed them. To be fruitful and multiply. So we see the name now of the, the sons of Japheth here from verse 2. The sons of Japheth were Goma, Magog, that, that, that name, uh, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, another important name. Uh, Tubal is also an important name. And, uh, and Tyras. The sons of Goma were Ashikinaz, Ripath, and Togama, the sons of J Javan were um, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastlands, interestingly, the coastland people of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to the families, into the nations. And the Karizon, the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizrim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havila, and Sabta, uh, and Sabta Rama, and, Sabtik, uh, and Sabtika. And the sons of Rama were Sheba and Didan. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. And Nimrod was a dark skin. Cush was a dark skin uh, person as well. Yeah, Shina is the same land as Babylon would have been a little larger than uh, Babylon was, so the land of the Chaldeans. Yeah. So they carried on with that tradition of being dominant. Yeah. So, but the name Magog obviously stems from there. So there is a connection between that, that name Magog there and the Magog that we are reading in the book of Revelation. But prior, after the book of Genesis, the Lord gives a prophecy, a prophecy through the mouth of his servant Ezekiel. But there's something that we also need to consider about Ezekiel, about the prophecies that he was given to deliver. He had a lot of uh, proverbs and prophecies, and some of the prophecies were not uh, necessarily um, intended to have physical manifestation because the Lord was using depiction of a reality that you want to see happen, but the, the material arrangement of that reality will not necessarily uh, mimic the content of the prophecy. And the Lord did that a lot with, um, uh, with, with Ezekiel. I use types as references, but not as equivalents of the components that should the experience when the prophecies are accomplished in, in, uh, in, in life. So what does Ezekiel tell us? There are quite a few scriptures that we'll read um, that will 
what we read that the only part, the only um, we might probably com com uh, concluding this aspect of the study of the fifth coming uh, uh, on this, and I will continue with the judgment uh, when we are given the opportunity. Okay. So, moving on to look at what Ezekiel have to say because he gives a lot of prophecy on Gog and Magog. So in chapter 38 of the book of Ezekiel, the Bible tells us, if you can start from one, uh, just to, to, to keep the sequential understanding. 38 verse 1, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, this is Ezekiel speaking, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, okay. the prince of Rosh. Meshech and Tubal. So the same Tubal line that we read in Genesis chapter 10, verse 2, and the same Meshech that we read there and Magog are back here with Ezekiel. And say, so Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia and Libya are with them. Persia, that is Iran, all of them with shield and helmet. Goma and all his troops, the house of Togoma from the, from the far north and all his troops. Many people are with you. So Togoma is also back here, Goma is also back here. They're all descendants of Japheth, and the Lord have lined them all up in the same context. Yeah? The people of the coastlands. So prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited in the latter years, you will come into the land of those who brought back from the sword and gathered for many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. So, so the Lord is saying about Gog and Magog that they will attack a peaceful settlement in Israel. That has not happened. So if we have to think that it's going to happen in our days, yeah, we need to look for an attachment. We need to look for a, a, a connection. Yeah, how that prophecy would manifest itself. In 14 of that Ezekiel 38, this is what the scripture says, So therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will, will you not know it? Okay. So, what the Lord is saying that the, the deception that Satan would uh, cause to happen, will, will, that will, 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 will cause to trigger, will be precisely to, to turn them into attacking a peaceful settlement. Okay? So when the Lord is saying, asking a question, that, will you not know it? I mean, somebody will tell you about it. Okay? Who is that someone? Is Satan. The one who deceives the world. So Gog is a person. Gog is the prince, so be the person leading the army of, of, of the land of Magog and will have others to accompany him. So it's going to be a huge army, well prepared for battle. Because you'll have enough time to prepare, obviously. 
a thousand years long enough time to to prepare your army quite as 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 good as, as well as you you could. And in sixteen verse sixteen, the Bible tells us of chapter thirty eight of the book of Ezekiel. Okay, the, the scripture reads, "You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land." It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know, may know me when I am hallowed in you, O God, before they arise. So the Lord will take glory. Every battle that we win, the Lord takes glory. So the world, the world will know that the Lord God is God. That the beast could not be compared to him in any measure at all so the impression that the world had of the beast they will have to think twice to make a comparison to the Lord God when they see the demonstration of his power because the false prophet was calling fire from heaven as a way of proving their superiority and the, the you know the the what people should uh, uh, should 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 gather as as an impression, you know, about how great that beast was. That was the intended purpose in deceiving people and to believe in in a the, the false deity. So the Lord says that I am agreeable with the idea of you attacking. My people attacking the saints of God because then I'll prove my power to the rest of the world. So, this, uh, this arrangement falls well within God's plan. That's why Satan is released to propagate that deception, to gather all these nations, to attack the saints of God that the Lord may show his power. Amen. We can look at verse 18 and 21 of the same scripture as well. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. 19. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. Yeah. 20. So that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountain shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. 22. And I will bring him to the judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many people who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstone, fire, and brimstone and if you go to back to the book of revelation we see this exactly how the lord god would destroy gog and magog and all that will come with him yeah. that's back in the book of revelation from chapters uh, from verse 7 chapter 20 now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released uh, from his per uh, from his prison, eight, and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, that we just read about, okay. to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city Jerusalem, as we just read there in the book of Ezekiel chapter 38 on the different uh, verses from um, from 1 down to the 22 
So they will surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And the Lord talked about the sword, hailstones and brimstone. And John summarizes that here by saying, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the the beast and the false prophet are. So the devil will go into the lake of fire as well as a finality. And they will be tormented day and night forever. So this is what's going to happen. But the idea of Gog and Magog as portrayed in the book of Ezekiel there is no occurrence in our dispensation to speak of. What has been proposed in terms of territory currently is that the, the area of uh, uh, the area mentioned in, in the book of um, uh, Ezekiel, the country of Ezekiel, you have the word, you have Meshach, you have Tubal, you have uh, Ro you have Rosh, yeah? and uh, some scholars of I've been able to analyze that uh, with uh, some reasonable evidence uh, uh, quite conclusively that that land that is spoken of is Russia yeah? and Meshik leads to the word Moscow and uh, others have also contributed to say that uh, it, it might not be entirely Russia this is a, a part of Turkey that is also involved okay? but if we look at the prophecy in terms of what we feel, or no, we feel what we believe uh, to be the case that um, the attack on Israel will be coming from Russia with Turkey or aided by Turkey and Russia, yeah, there will be quite a lot of gaps in that um, assertion. Because Israel needs to be organized to receive the multitude of the saints that will come at the forthcoming of the Lord Jesus Christ at Armageddon and will stay behind. And the Lord have organized a camp, a habitation for his beloved. It's going to be in Jerusalem, in Israel, because Zion is where he likes to dwell, it's his mountain. This is a spiritual environment. It is not necessarily er earthly. Just as Satan shows himself in the Garden of Eden, paradise, which is a spiritual environment, he also goes there to, for the same reason, to try and kill to try and steal, to try and destroy, but it fails miserably because that was his end. Yeah. So we are proposing that we this won't happen now because the book of Revelation tells us that it won't happen now. It will happen at the fifth coming, before the fifth coming, because that's the plan of God. Armageddon has happened. Now it is this battle against Gog and uh, Gog of the land of Magog but the figurative aspect of it is that the Lord is not saying necessarily that um, there will be a preview to that particular occurrence as spoken of in the book of Revelation that what Ezekiel has prophesied may have to happen first before what John saw happens now, both prophecies are speaking of the same thing. The account of Ezekiel is referring to the accounts that John has given us. So, one needs to be careful, obviously, with the current um, war effort being mounted. 
by, by Russia against Ukraine as some sort of a, a precipitate to, to move from there and then to attack Israel. Because that couldn't happen. Because Satan has not been locked up for a thousand years yet. And he's the one who causes this war to happen by his deceptive scheme, which the Lord allows to happen because it feeds into his plan. So except Satan has been arrested, which has not happened, that therefore does not need to be released, which could not happen because he has not been arrested yet. And it could not happen before the birth of Armageddon. Because the sequence is quite clear. But is there any significance to what Russia is doing now? Yes, there is a significance because it is a sign of the end time. But the connection to their effort, to what we are reading about Gog, and Magog in the book of Ezekiel and the book of Revelation does not have a component of association. That's why we need to be very careful as to how to address that and how to interpret the prophecy in that context. So the war that will be finalized or be fought as a finality against the sense of God in Israel, where Gog and Magog are, are parties of interest, will happen because Satan will deceive them. But Satan won't be able to do it after a thousand years have been served in prison in the bottomless pit. But before that happens, he has to be arrested first. But where does it get arrested? It gets arrested at the end of the battle of Armageddon, which has not happened yet. So this effort will not lead to the war spoken of in the book of Revelation here, in chapter 20, from verse 7 downward, about Gog and Magog. Not at this stage, not at this dispensation. It will happen after Armageddon has taken place. A thousand years later, that is. So there is, there is a long way to go for that ha to have to happen. So currently, all that we are waiting for is the second coming. We can't have the third coming without the second coming. We can't have the fourth coming without the second and the third. And we can't have the fifth coming without the preceding second, third and fourth. And we couldn't have had second, third, fourth, uh, second, third and fourth, fourth and fifth without the first which has already happened. So what we are waiting for is the second coming of the Lord. So what's going to happen at the fifth coming, at part of the fifth coming, the last battle, the preceding, the precursor, where Gog and Magog are involved, will happen after Armageddon because Satan has to be involved in deceiving those nations into going to war against the sense of God, against the, 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 the beloved city Jerusalem, where the sense of God will be camping in a spiritual environment on earth. Because within the presence of the Lord, where the Holy, the mighty Holy Spirit is, Because we will be able to see him. It's just incredible. I mean, just imagine seeing the face of the Holy Spirit. Good God. You know? It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. These are some of the things that the you know the promise that we God's people really need to cherish and fall in love over and over again because it is the meaning of life itself. That one day you'll be shaking your hands with the person who created life. You can ask him any question. As Paul says, now we see as though through a glass, but then we'll see clearly. We'll know even as we are known ourselves. 
incredible, incredible stuff to look forward to. So this is our, you know, our, our contribution. Yes, Gog and Magog makes reference according to the, the two concepts where you have Russia because the word Meshek refers to Moscow. It definitely is a, 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 an acceptable uh, conclusion. But Sorry, there is, I'm having trouble understanding right now. There is Please try a part of Turkey also involved. Okay? And all these uh, uh, nations of the coastlands will be involved. But they will be deceived. They will be led into that war by deception. And the agent of that deception is Satan. So because Satan hasn't been bound yet, we can't speak of that war. And because Armageddon has not happened yet, we can't speak of that war. So that's the missing component, because you have to try to connect that the events that are currently happening will lead to what we read in the book of Ezekiel, will be very wrong in saying so. Because the missing link is Satan leading the deception after a thousand years of imprisonment in the bottom of the spit, which has not happened. So we can't speak of that now. But there is significance in this effort because it points to the last days because the Lord Jesus Christ said well, there will be wars and rumours of wars. And if that part is true. Amen. Amen. So we'll stop here. For this on this occasion and we thank the Lord for the effort that we've been able to to apply by his grace and um, we shall talk about the judgment in the second part and um, and we'll see why the, why the Lord wants us to uh, to, to lead to lead uh, you know to to move on to um, in, in, in this stage because the after the comings then there is the time of um, of the saints where we receive prizes, we receive awards and rewards from the Lord. And um, that also needs to be covered because it is an exciting time. We are talking about our lives in the kingdom, brethren. It is not some stories in, the, in a book somewhere uh, where for, for the purpose of literature we, we are looking into. No, this is our lives that we are talking about. The lives have been, we have been promised. There's nothing better than this. So if it's only this line that we have hope, Paul tells us that we, of, of all men we're the most pitiable. So we must look forward to that city. Very, very important, brethren. And we hope that you've been blessed by this. And do uh, check that we've got a series on, on, on this uh, that topic from the, the second coming uh, downwards or upwards and we'll con con conclude on the fifth coming by the, the grace of God uh, next time we have the occasion to to meet again and, and, and learn together so stay blessed and may the Lord be gracious unto you as he has done uh, always and uh, may your week be fruitful and prosperous and may the Lord bless the work of your hand and may it cause you to multiply seven, to seven times and may he cause you to ride with the wings of an eagle and that you may run and be weary and walk in a faint. Drink from the fountain of life and receive life from him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stay blessed. See you again soon.